Dr. Geshwin received his MD in Neuroscience PhD degrees through the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He completed his neurology residency at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine in Baltimore and his fellowship in behavioral neurology at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center. He's now an associate professor at UCSF and has two research branches. The first focuses on the assessment and treatment of rapidly progressive dementias, while the second focuses on cognitive dysfunction and movement disorders such as Huntington's disease, CBD, PSP, and other Parkinsonian dementias. Thank you, Christine, um, Adam, uh, Bruce, uh, and everyone for putting this incredible symposium together. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about a, a very, I'll just touch on some genetics and PSP. It, it's a very, I'm trying to make it a very simple talk because I think sometimes when people talk in a complicated manner about genetics, it can be very con more confusing uh, than anything. Um, so I'm going to uh, and I want to thank uh, Jennifer Yokoyama and Jamie Fong, a geneticist and genetics counselor, for helping um, with these slides today. So I wanted to start by talking about just a basic overview of, of genetics. We all have cells in the body, and each cell is a nucleus, and inside the nucleus are, are 23 pairs of chromosomes, and here's what a chromosome might look like. Um, and basically, one copy of your chromosome is uh, from your mother, one copy is from your father, and basically what a chromosome is, it's DNA. And DNA, uh, this is a strand of DNA, this is the double helix uh, structure here that, uh, for the Nobel Prize, uh, Watson and Crick. And this DNA structure has many genes in it. Um, each, each one has thousands of genes. And each gene uh, makes several proteins. So another way of looking at that is that we each have um, 23 pairs of chromosomes, and which is basically each chromosome is a strand of DNA that's very tightly coiled. And each piece of DNA has many genes on it. So it, this might be a gene here in the DNA. And this gene basically is a blueprint for a protein. And proteins sort of determine how cells function, basically how the body works. And one of the proteins, the tau protein, is one that you've heard about from several of the speakers this morning. So I don't mean to scare anybody with this slide, but this is sort of an outline of or schematic of what a gene might look like. So what happens is this might be a piece of DNA, and in blue are the actual parts of the DNA that end up making the protein. But there are several, uh, and these are called exons in blue, and there, there are these intervening sequences, which are called introns, which although in the end they don't make up the protein, they're involved in the function of this exon and of this gene. So you can have, um, and then also in addition, there are parts that are before the, uh, in, within the gene in the early part we call promoter, that actually regulate. It's sort of an on-off switch. Does this gene get turned on? Does it get turned off? When does it get turned on? In certain cells, it might get turned on. In certain situations, such as maybe under stress, it will get turned on. Other times, it might get turned off. So these are the promoter functions. So there are lots of, my point of this slide is that there are lots of ways in which you can f affect a gene that will affect the downstream function, the effect of the protein, either making the protein in an abnormal form, not making the protein at all. And sometimes there are mutations uh, in the gene, and a mutation is a permanent heritable change in that sequence I just showed you. And there are many different types of mutations, but usually they lead to disease. And they tend to be uncommon or rare, but they have a very big effect. You have a mutation, you'll get the disease, but they're, they're rare. Um, and then I'm going to skip talking about the allele for right now, but then there are polymorphisms and rare variants. And polymorphisms we can think about as being common variants. So we have two copies of every gene, and on one copy uh, you might have uh, a, an allele um, that a lot of people have, but on your other copy, maybe the copy you got from your mother, um, you might have a variation that's a little less common than population. And these polymorphisms uh, sometimes can affect one's 
susceptibility or predisposition to certain uh, functions, uh, such as you might be better at math, or you might be a very verbal person, or they might increase your susceptibility to getting a disease. And then there are things called rare variants, which are even less common than polymorphisms. Polymorphisms are greater than 1% of the people in the population have these variations. And a rare variant we usually define by uh, much, usually much less than 1%. Now, sometimes a rare variant can actually cause disease, but sometimes it might just make one more or less susceptible to a disease. Um, and not just disease, it might make you more susceptible to becoming an artist. Uh, so uh, not just illness. And then sometimes there are these variations and we really don't know what they do. We identify them, but we're still in the process of trying to figure out what their role is. So, um, sorry, this is here. So, oops, sorry about that. So, here um, we have a gene, and this, on this gene there's a mutation, but this could just as easily not be a mutation that causes disease, but a polymorphism or a rare variant that may, might affect how this protein comes out. So a mutation might affect the way this protein looks, the shape of the protein. And that uh, protein, if it has an abnormal shape or maybe part of the protein doesn't work the way it works in most people, the function of a cell and the function of a circuit in, a, in the brain might not work the same way. It might make you better at math or it might actually lead to a disease like PSP. So, um, a mutation might lead to disease, but there could be variations like polymorphisms, which are pretty common, or rare variants that actually are less common that might actually not cause disease, but might make you more susceptible to getting a disease or more uh, susceptible to, um, to be at risk for other factors. So here's an example of, let's say, a father and a mother, and they each have two copies of every uh, chromosome. So here I'm showing one chromosome. And in blue is maybe a chromosome with a mutation. And black represents people who have an illness. Uh, and in this case, this might be a, a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease. And in this case, the father has one bad copy of a gene or a mutation and one good copy, and the mother has two um, good copies. And the father will pass one of these to each child, and the mother will pass one copy of each allele to each child. So each child has a 50% of risk of getting the good gene or the, uh, the bad gene or the good gene. And in this case, uh, unfortunately, half of the children, as statistically expected, receive the bad copy, and so ultimately they'll get the, the disease. Now, this is what we call a mutation. It's what we call autosomal dominant. It's rare, um, and it causes rare diseases usually, but it has a large effect. So if you uh, even though these are rare, if you get this mutation, the effect is big. Um, we're not really finding this in PSP. Most of the studies with PSP and cortical basal degeneration haven't found this kind of large effect. Um, what they found is more uh, polymorphisms and rare variations that seem to affect one's risk for getting the disease, but it's not an all or none thing. So just as an example, um, there's as I've just mentioned, some genetic variations might have a smaller effect, not cause disease, but increase one's risk for getting disease. So maybe there's a variation in one's DNA, and that variation might affect one's brain structure by affecting certain cell functions, and maybe it makes you better at doing Sudoku or worse at Sudoku, or maybe it makes you predisposed to getting PSP or CBD. And why would be identifying these genes variations important? Well, because they can tell us the underlying biology of an illness, pretty much uh, very similar to what you've just heard from Dr. R Rabinovich and Lee and Dr. Miller. And they might also tell us this is a target. We can find a variation. Maybe this is a target which we can treat the disease. So n understanding the disease will allow us to uh, help develop drugs for targets. And it might also tell us an early risk factor for a disease. So it might tell us, aha, if somebody has this variation, um, we might be able to intervene earlier. So we might be able to identify those at risk and begin to modify their risk uh, before the disease ever develops. So there's increasing evidence that there are genetic risk factors at play in PSP. 
but not the genetic risk factors that definitely cause the disease, but risk factors that might increase one's risk for developing the disease. So uh, one study found that in patients with PSP, they're much more likely than expected by chance to have a first degree relative, usually a blood relative, uh, with dementia or Parkinsonism. Um, and then there are other studies that have shown that familial PSP much be, uh, might be much more common than we initially thought, and it's probably because not everybody might present with the classic PSP, as, as Robin Riddle mentioned, there are different ways in which PSP can present. Maybe the uh, Richardson syndrome, where you have the early falls, the problems with eye movements, kind of what we call, might, might call the classic. Or maybe they have more of a PSP that looks like a cortical basal degeneration or a Parkinson's disease. So this very, or, or maybe it presents early as a psychiatric illness. So, um, so there might be lots of ways in which PSP might be presenting or forms of PSP. Um, and so what's been missing in some of the genetic studies um, in, in PSP and CBD is that most studies have looked at common genetic variants in large populations. Um, and they've been looking for rare variants that have a high penetrance, or what we say, call a pretty big effect um, in a small number of families. But there's increasing evidence, um, Dr. Miller alluded to this with the A152T uh, variation that was identified by UCSF and collaborators at UCLA, uh, that are, these are rare variants that don't have high penetrance. Their effect seems to be small, but, it's a, but it does seem to increase one's risk for developing disorders, PSP, CBD, possibly even Alzheimer's disease. So uh, to this end, uh, with funding from the Tau Consortium, uh, we've started a study called, which we're calling the FAM-PSP study in which we're trying to identify some of these rare variants, possibly with small effects, uh, that might be uh, a cause for PSP and related disorders such as cortical basal degeneration. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring in patients who have PSP and a first degree blood relative who have any neurological or neuropsychiatric disorder. And what we would like is we would like to have the patient in the study, we would like to have those in the family who might be affected with a neurologic or psychiatric disorder. And we'd also want people in the family who are older and don't have a neurologic or psychiatric disorder because they're really important for controls. We'd want to see are there gene variations that are present in those who have uh, some form of illness but not present in those who don't have the illness. Um, and so people who come in for this study, they undergo a neurologic exam, cognitive testing, and a, a, a simple blood draw. And sometimes we can do this study in conjunction with other studies that we do at our center. And we're actually trying to be very collaborative with this. And we started by working with three other, uh, with two other campuses of the University of California, UCSD in San Diego and UCLA in, in Los Angeles. And we might expand. And if one um, knows of families or patients who might be interested, Joe Weiner is the study coordinator. Is Joe, are you here? There's Joe in the back waving the beard. Uh, and this is his uh, telephone and email, and he has um, some uh, simple one-page summaries of this if you'd like, uh, if you want to pass this on. Um, and I want to thank the Tau Consortium for funding that study, um, my colleagues at the UCSF Memory and Aging Center, um, and of course um, the, our patients and families. Without um, their assistance, we couldn't do what we've done so far. Thank you.